Good day, guys. How are we doing? Good. Good, guys. Welcome to the Enjoy the Journey podcast with Jackson Milan, the Wealth Mentor, co-founder and CEO of Aureus Financial. My name is Sam Panetta. I'm the COO and the co-founder of Aureus Financial. And we're here with Will Hoskins of PMC Property Group. Hey, nice, mate. Nice to be here, guys. Thanks for having me. Mate, it's uh, good to have you here. I know that we've been bugged by a lot of our audience to do a, a podcast on property. Uh, so we figured we'd uh, get the expert here to, to talk about it. Yeah, it's, it's a topical conversation at the moment, so it's nice to be in here. Australians love property. They it's their do. favourite thing. They do, yeah. Mate, so tell us a little bit about yourself. So um, how did you start your business? Uh, what, what interested you in property? Give, give yeah. us that crash course. So Will Hosking, uh, one of the co-founders and directors of PMC Property, um, we're an independent property advice and buyers agency business. Um, I guess in a nutshell, we look after both home buyers um, aspiring to buy their dream home and also investors. So in the investment space, we're in the residential and commercial markets, uh, assisting both one-off investors and also um, those looking to build a portfolio over time. Um, PMC is coming up to four years old in April. Um, Prior to that, uh, my business partner James and I started a property advice division for a national valuation firm. Um, by the name of Propel. We did that for about two and a half years. Okay. And prior to that, we worked at a company, a previous company called Capital 360 for about two years. So we've worked together um, in the industry for coming on nine years, okay. um, but PMC itself is is coming on four years in April. So you've been immersed in property for the better part of a decade. I have, yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure you've seen a bit. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I actually, my journey, funnily enough, started um, well before I got into the industry in a professional sense. So um I was fortunate enough back in 2001, uh, my sister and I kicked off a little portfolio together. Uh, our great grandmother passed on a very small amount of CBA shares to us um, and we decided to dispose of those and jump into a one bedroom apartment up in Milton in okay. Brisbane, uh, yeah. it's in the Brisbane CBD. Um, funnily enough, or would you believe it, that was, um, it was a one bedroom apartment worth $138,000 wow. in 2001. Um, and we were lucky, you know, I think there's there's always an element of luck in investing. We were lucky that the timing getting into the Brisbane market, we saw a bit of an upkick in the market, which then led to us two years later buying a two-bedroom apartment in Brisbane again, in Paddington. In keeping two, number one. Keeping number one. Yeah, right. very yeah, good. Yeah, buy and hold strategy. Um, and that was 2003, we got into a second one, and then we led on to buying another subsequent property in, in Darwin, and the journey continued. So, yeah, whilst in a professional sense, I've been in the industry for coming on nine years, um, as a, an active investor, I've been fortunate enough to be in the industry, industry coming on uh, well, that way, 17 years now, 16, 17 years. Wow. Yeah, okay. so good. So good. And you hit on a couple of things there, mate. I think that um, Australians love property, right? It seems to be that uh, everyone wants to have that bricks and mortar and, and obviously continue to build their wealth through property here. What do you think is the reason why Australians have this affinity for property? Yeah, they really do. They have an affiliation with property. It's interesting because a lot of the time um, we get clients that come to us that ask about the property piece first before they've got the rest of their house in order. So time and time again, you know, people will, why? I'm not entirely sure. I think it's um, it's been born over time, probably off the back of the market performing so well for a number of decades now. Mm-hmm. Um, and as a result, people have quite an appetite, particularly in the investment space. Um, bricks and mortar, you can touch it, you can see it, you can feel it. Um, you're also very much in charge of the journey as opposed to maybe in the equity space. And I, th- I still think equities play a really important role in someone's wealth, overall wealth creation. But in the equity space, you've got someone else that might be a CEO that's taking that company in a certain direction where you don't have a lot of control. Yeah. Um, in the property side of things, you do. So it, it is very much part of the Australian psyche. We often get clients that come to us and say, I want to put the property piece in place first when we will then often push back and say, well, what are your goals and objectives? Um, let's talk about if we're, how your structuring is going to work, what type of entity you might be buying the asset in, how is that going to influence your wealth creation, maybe your family objectives, um, incomes down the track, etc., cash flow position. Um, get them talking to um, an advisor like yourself, Jackson, um, and then after they get their goals, objectives, a strategy in place, obviously having a chat to someone like Sam, um, talking about the loan side or the debt piece, and then we're in a position then to have a chat to them and work about what that next step in the property journey might look like. There's a lot of moving parts, isn't there? Yeah, and it's, this, this is one of the reasons you and I get along so well, Will. It's you are one of the very few people in the entire property industry that take a holistic view of someone's wealth, right? Most people in the 
in the property industry. I know you've got a story about this that, that I'll get you to tell us in a minute. You would, a client would come in and they'd just sell them whatever property they could sell them as quickly as possible, put some commission in the bank and, and shut the door and, and you're done. And I know your business operates completely different from that. You take a holistic response and then you, you stay with the client for years. You help even manage the properties once, you, once you've uh, accumulated it for them. So I admire you. I admire you for that. Tell us about the the spruiking, uh, I guess, event that happened in your life when you were on the the, the roar end of the stick from some of the more unscrupulous people in the property industry. If you yeah. don't mind sharing, no, us. no, not at all. Yeah, it is. Um, it's amazing. The reason I got in into the industry was I actually have come from a family construction business. And funnily enough, my passion was born out of my sister and I. So we went property one, two, and then thought, okay, well, we've ridden a little bit of an upkick in the Brisbane cycle. This seems to all be a bit too easy. Um, let's jump in and go for a third. Uh, I was actually at university at the time doing a Bachelor of Business and a mate of mine said, um, why don't you come along to a property investment seminar in Bagala? So I was reading property investment books. I had piles of magazines beside my bed. It was where my passion was. Uh, went along to that seminar and... Look, a lot of the points, the fundamental points that were presented to us that evening made a lot of sense and a lot of the reasons why I believe property is a great asset class to, um, to create wealth. Uh, the problem was was the actual asset at the back end of that presentation. So they then asked um, whoever was in the room, there's about 60 of us all ranging from the ages of 18 to 60, let's call it, everyone with different um, objectives, risk profiles, goals, transitioning to retirement or accumulation phase, etc., um, whoever was interested in pursuing that relationship to sign a um, registration form. And I was blown away by the queue of people lined up to sign a registration form on the way out. So what really, um, the fascinating thing about that was how easily someone can entrust someone within a 30-minute presentation yeah. with their wealth, a really important cog in their wealth creation um, phase, and that might be a half million dollar asset or thereabouts. Anyway, I was, funny enough, I was one of them. So we registered uh, and I fell into the trap of um, buying an off-the-plan apartment for $428,000 up in Darwin okay. in a complex of 300, predominantly investor purchased um, off the back of all the hype around the um, impacts project up there, which mm-hmm. is a gas project out off Darwin. Um, great market. So that was in 2007. Um, we then end up selling a property in 2014 for $421,000. So we lost a little bit of money if you factor in stamp duty, but we're probably quite lucky that we walked away with not too much of a hit. Mm -hmm. The fascinating thing about that and the experience I had was that we bought in an excellent market at the time. Had we bought a freestanding asset in Darwin, we actually would have gone close to doubling our money. So from 2007 to 2014, Darwin actually performed really well. So a great lesson that it was good market, wrong asset type. Um, so for me, that journey of buying that property, we actually didn't pay the company that we went through a fee for service. Uh, they were paid by the developer. Mm-hmm. So that was a great eye-opener for me, firstly to realise how easily the average Australian can entrust their money with someone they've only met for an hour, given it, um, and also that how easily we can forget that if you're not actually in, in the property investment space, if you're not actually paying a fee for service, um, then I'd question are they acting in your best interest. Yeah. It's it's really important to give some consideration to that. So it was a it was an interesting journey. Um, it's where my passion for the industry started, and I thought, okay, well, um, there's an opportunity now to lift the standards of advice and professionalism um, in the industry, and hence why I jumped in professionally. And I think you have, mate. I, I've been around property guys for a long time. Jackson's looking at me, staring at me. I get excited when I start talking about property. <laughs> and you will. You are probably the most honest bloke in property. And I think it's probably because you've seen all the, the bad side of it, what it can actually do to someone. You think, no way, this is not how we're going to do yeah. things. And that's, I guess, how you've built such a, a robust strategy with PMC for how you actually pick properties for people. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's, it was, um, and that's where my passion lies as well. You know, we had, a, when we actually started the advice division at Propel prior to starting PMC, 
James and I made it a motto that as we built the the team within the division and since coming on to PMC that we'll only this is very much investment discussion. It's a slightly different unoccupied, obviously, but from an investment perspective, we'll only actually put forward a property that we would buy in our own portfolio to a client. Really simple motto, and we all stand by that. As well as um, any of our buyers advocates within the team or property advisors, we prefer to refer ourselves as refer to ourselves as. Um, is that we're actually acquiring assets as well in the markets we're mm-hmm. buying. So we're walking the talk. I think that's pretty important as well. I've seen that a lot, mate. Like, uh, I, I, we spoke about this earlier on our, on our Q&A, um, and I get hit up probably about two or three times at least a week by these developers or spruikers on LinkedIn um, trying to get us to basically take their stock to our clients. And there's such a low barrier to entry and, and it really is a little bit of the Wild West when it comes to the property industry across Australia, that the a lack of innovation um, or regulation, should I say, that's protecting the average consumer, the mum and dad. And, and they're the ones that are getting taken advantage of in yeah. this situation. Like I've, I've seen so many people that got caught up in, in the Darwin issue of, of all the spruiking that happened there in Gladstone, yeah. um, Townsville, Cairns, all of these areas where vacancy rates are now double digits. Um, yeah. You can't get, we can't give away the properties. Yeah. Um, and uh, they've, they've really damaged their trajectory towards their their, their idea of financial freedom yeah. just because they thought that they were getting the right advice. Yeah. And it really can have a detrimental impact, particularly for what we see and you guys would as well, for first-time investors. You know, if they don't get it right, unfortunately, it can really set them back. For someone who's got a multiple portfolio already or assets in other asset classes, um, then it's not so much of an issue. But for first-time investors, it's it can be really detrimental on their wealth creation journey. So, uh, yeah, it's it's something that I always encourage all clients to do is in our space in particular, um, ask how someone's remunerated. It's absolutely your right to do so. And they should openly tell you how they're remunerated. Yeah. Now, we buy probably 80% of the investment properties we buy for clients are established property. Mm. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean there's not good opportunities in the new space. Sure. But if you are going down that path, if someone's suggesting to you or recommending a certain asset, ask them how they're remunerated. Mm-hmm. Ask all the questions that you need to to make sure you feel comfortable. Um, if they're being remunerated by someone else, yeah, make sure they're acting in your best interest. Yeah, and, and also ask how much because it is it is unbelievable hearing some of the commissions that are offered. It's highway robbery, I believe, Mm -hmm. Um, because that's effectively, even if developers can get a discount or project markets can get a discount on the stock they're selling, um, effectively, no matter how big that discount, uh, often the the percentage commission you're paying is just built into the purchase price. Yeah. A hundred percent, man. I, I I saw last year. I remember there was this case. Some of these Melbourne off the plan apartments. They were selling them for four hundred green, and um, some of them were doing like twelve percent commissions. Do you know what I mean? They're fifty thousand dollars commissions on a four hundred thousand dollars apartment. It's someone's paying for that commission, and it's at the end of the day, it's the, the investor who's buying the property. So you you really need to tread tread carefully with these sort of things. Yeah, and I think you hit a good point there, mate, on, on a couple of notes there. That there's nothing wrong with buying new property. Like personally, the last property that I bought was brand new, and I did that because it's interstate. The last thing I want to be dealing with with, with things going wrong and having to, to get people to go fix it, and I can't keep an eye on it. I've got a builder's warranty. I'm going to get a, a higher affluent tenant yeah. um, and less worries for me being a, a busy business owner yeah. um, but it comes down to getting the right advice around the right area because yeah, that's right. the last thing you want to do is buy a smack bang in the middle of the city where the at the open homes are giving like iPads and trying to get people <laughs> yeah, to turn up you know? <laughs> yeah exactly and then the tenant can demand or whether it's a freestanding home they might say well what um, pool maintenance and lawn maintenance and everything built into it because they're struggling to get yeah. Yeah. Um, tenants so absolutely the right asset type so my story being the Darwin scenario, it was the right market, wrong asset type. Yeah. And what I um, I think with property, we can be guilty all of us of over-sciencing it. It's actually quite a simple asset class in many ways. Um, the In order for property values to increase um, or decrease, effectively in its simplest form, it actually comes down to supply and demand, yeah. like most asset classes. So... And for example, up and down the East Coast at the moment, we have some concerns that um, particularly in the likes of Brisbane and Melbourne, the medium to high density unit market is oversupplied. 
Therefore, um, you don't have that demand sp- supply tension from a value perspective because you've got an oversupply, not enough demand, so prices either stagnate or soften. And that is often then reflected in the rental side as well. Mm-hmm. So if, if you've got too much supply coming into the market from a rental perspective, then your vacancy rates increase, which means you're the asking price of your rental properties are decreasing. And that's where you see the likes of rental guarantees and, and iPads and those sorts of things offered <laughs> to people because um, they're trying to incentivise either the buyer by a rental guarantee or the tenants with an iPad to take on the property. As soon as I hear a rental guarantee, I, I would, and I, should, I shouldn't generalise, but 90 times out of 100, I'd run for the hills because yeah. it's just used as a selling tool effectively. Mm-hmm. Well, if it was a good property, you wouldn't need a rental yeah, guarantee because people guarantee. would be tripping over their, their selves to, to take it on. You know, yeah. imagine having a, a nice two-bedroom unit in Manly. Like, you With don't a need a rental guarantee, guarantee yeah. for that. There's going to be someone going to rent that property off you. So, And if you're buying in a tower of, like, Darwin, fragrance, like my experience, a tower of 300, where predominantly maybe 80 to 90% of the purchases are investors, um, we focus on stock that have owner-occupier appeal. The reason for that, or properties that have owner-occupier appeal, the reason for that is one, when, if, and when you, it comes to selling the property, um, owner-occupiers fall in love with the property through That's their right. heart, not a calculator. Um, generally speaking, your owner-occupiers have a lower loan-to-value ratio, and naturally, owner-occupiers, people need a roof over their head. So if the economy goes through a tougher period or the market softens, the property market, they'll they'll work a lot harder to hold on to the property itself. Yeah. Whereas investors, if the market turns or the economy turns, they'll sell. You know, market. if they've got that opportunity to sell, they'll sell, which means more stock comes onto the market, more supply, less demand. So you don't, you can't um, ask uh, such a, you know, you might have to discount to offload that property. So keeping in mind that supply-demand thing is focusing on areas or asset types that have higher own occupier appeal mm-hmm. um, as opposed to foc- focusing on stock or properties that are predominantly investor purchased. Mm. And I think that there's there's a couple of barriers to entry. I, I think that we always say, whenever we get property questions, we always say our go-to is you need to get the right advice. Mm. But I think that um, a lot of people have the, the idea that getting good advice when it comes to property is too expensive. And, and look, we know that most buyers agents or property advisors that are fee-for-service charge anywhere between 10, 20 grand, somewhere around there, which for somebody who's buying, say, their first property, that, that's a pretty sizable amount that they might have to add on yeah, top of their deposit absolutely. to get that advice. Um, so in saying that, for the average punter who might not be there yet, where could they potentially find out some information about that? Of, of, say, for example, uh, how many owner-occupiers to, to renters are there in a particular market? Yeah, I'll, I'll come back to that question, Jackson. That's a really good one. But just touching on the cost side, and, and absolutely, I'm aware of the fact that um, it's not cheap. It's, it's not a cheap exercise. Mm. However, I think it's actually just um, sort of rejigging our mindset around that somewhat because we don't, as a business PMC, we don't actually charge a percentage based fee model. But a lot of our peers in the industry do. Um, we charge a flat fee as such, but. Let's say working it out on a percentage basis. Let's say if it's around 2% of the value of the asset or between 1.8 and 2.5, somewhere thereabouts. Um, if, if you're doing, let's call it a half a million dollar investment, you know, it's not $10,000 worth of CBA shares or BHP shares, it's a half a million dollar asset. Mm-hmm. Um, if you get that wrong, the impact, as we discussed earlier, on your wealth creation is significant. You've then got an asset that might be draining your cash flow or might not go up in value or potentially go backwards in value. So we target a growth band of 6 to 7% per annum for our clients. We believe that's realistic and achievable. Um, sure, markets are cyclical, so you might get... 12% one year, 15% the next, and then no growth the following. Who knows? Market cycle like Sydney's just gone through the top of its current growth cycle, and I think it'll track sideways for a period of time. But let's say on average we target 6 or 7% per annum. If it costs someone around about 2% to get it right, so to buy the right asset, the right location, it ticks all the boxes from an investment grading point of view, you don't have a housing commission next door or a DA application that's going to negatively impact on your asset or you're in a flood affected area or the list goes on. Um, if you get it right, you should recoup effectively your money within the first year or the first few months of that first year. But because we all, or we advocate at PMC again to hold on to properties for the long term. So ideally, putting aside changes in personal circumstances, if a client can hold on to an asset for seven to 10 years or more ideally, then that initial 2% to get it right is significantly dwarfed over the life of that investment. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, 
too often we see someone say, well, I can't, that cost is cost prohibitive. I'm going to go out and do it on my own, make a mistake. Exactly right. And it's far more costly than 2% that mistake because they might get that property revalued in five years yeah. and it hasn't gone up in value or they struggle to get it tenanted or next door there's housing commission they didn't realise so then tenants keep turning over every six months because they leave the property. So many number of things can go wrong if you don't get it right. Um, but I'm absolutely aware of the fact that it, it isn't cheap and, and um, there are some people out there that might need to take it on first themselves. Um, I think a good starting point for those types of people is um, education. Read as much as you can. Learn as much as you can. Lean on your advisor. Lean on your broker because um, they've had good experience dealing with various clients. They should have a rough understanding as to what makes sense and what, and what doesn't. There's various um, websites out there where you can get statistical information. So one for vacancy rates, for argument's sakes, SQM Research. Um, that will tell you, um, you can put in the postcode or a suburb name and look at what the vacancy rate of that area is. So 3%, we, we consider 3% 3, 3 vacancy to, to be about an equilibrium in the residential market. Um, so anything lower than three is good. Anything above three, you need to just start digging a bit deeper and asking why. Um, so SQM Research, you might find a suburb that you like the look of and jump on and punch in that postcode, see what the vacancy rate's like. If it's through the roof, it's, if it's up around 6%, you need to be a bit cautious, dig a bit deeper. Um, the only interesting thing about that um, fragment sake is that SQM don't actually split the difference between houses and units. So you might be focusing on houses, whereas a new unit complex has come online. So that's all of a sudden put another 50 units onto the rental market. Skewed, Therefore, skewed. the vacancy rate mm -hmm. skewed. So um, there's RP data, there's price finder, um, there's various, you might even subscribe to some reports on areas you like um, through re research houses. Uh, it can be pretty daunting to decipher through it's all that. a lot that. of information, isn't it? Yeah. Long-term growth rates, that's really important. We look at historical growth rates are really important. Sure, areas gentrify and change over time, but um, yeah, it's important to really dig deep on the statistical analysis, the key statistics that you want to focus on for that area. Um, lean on your advisors if you don't think you can fund the cost of a, an independent advisor to help you. And I think in any case, and I agree with you 100%, one of my mottos is you stick to what you know and you outsource everything else. Like if, if you had a, a, a pain in your wisdom tooth, you're not going to go to your kitchen drawer and pull out a, <laughs> a hammer and, and you have try. a crack at it yourself. There's probably a few that would try. Someone, I'm sure yeah, someone's sure. And then end up going to the, the yeah, dentist. Yeah, and you probably do more damage than what if you yeah. went to the dentist in the first place. And uh, I don't know why people have this different set of values when it comes to putting a price on good quality advice. Yeah. And look, we run into this as well. Um, and and of, of course, there's clients yeah, that that, uh, that we, we quite fee to them and we say, well, we're going to guide you to achieve these certain outcomes, but they just can't get themselves yeah. past the, the dollars and yeah. cents. Um, and ultimately, a lot of those people, some of them do well, but I think it comes back to your original point, some of them get really lucky. Yeah. Um, and I think it's about taking away that, that element of luck and using the, the numbers and, and quantifying your decision so you can do it objectively to minimise the chance of getting it wrong. Yeah. And uh, I think a really important thing, again, not only in our space, but in any, you know, whether you're looking for the right advisor to assist you or broker is ask them um, the experience they've had to date with other clients. Mm. Or for us, ask what properties we've been buying recently for other clients. See it, feel it. Get us to send you case studies, links, mm. um, contact details of existing clients. So speak to... Make sure you dig deeper um, on the advisor or the broker or the, the property advisor you, you're working with um, to get the feel as to actually what they're doing. Yeah. Um, oh, okay, these are the properties you guys have been buying. It brings it to life. It brings trust to the table. They see what they're getting. Um, I encourage all clients, you know, even for us, if they're looking to come on board with us, the client is push back and ask us as many questions as you want from the outset because then the, the journey is just so much more enjoyable. You know, there's, you've got to lift the hood. That's the thing. And, and I've heard a lot of times that when clients have done that, they've been met with the objection, oh, that's my intellectual property. And I'm proud of the work that I do for my clients. And I know Sam is, and from, from speaking to you well, over, over the last few months and through our interactions, you're proud of what you do for your clients. So your advisor, if they are proud of what they do, they should be willing to share that Absolutely. with you. And it's not like they're going to be able to, to steal that and go and do it themselves. By all means, if they, if they can get enough out of, of those case studies to be able to go and do it for themselves, then best of luck to them. Uh, but uh, you shouldn't be gu they shouldn't yeah. be guarding that. Um, it's about sharing it. You know? Absolutely. It's no different if someone comes to us and says, 
So what markets are you currently buying? We openly tell people what markets, because if I was to argue, sit back here and say um, Newcastle, mm. for argument's sake, or Toowoomba or Brisbane or Perth or Canberra, let's use Newcastle as an example. I can tell people to go and buy in Newcastle. Once you get up to Newcastle and you work out, they had the patch of bulk of floods in 2007, half the area is zoned for flooding, half the area is zoned for mine subsidence, there's a lot of housing commission, there's a lot of low-lying areas. I mean, it's a needle in the haystack for them to work out the right areas, right suburbs, right streets, right side of the street, right aspect, right floor plan. So I absolutely agree, you know, without holding back too much IP. Yeah, mate, this ties in with all, all the other points of, of, you know, people who don't want to pay the fee, but they don't understand the amount of value. If you listen to that last sentence, that's the amount of value that you get from paying the fee. It's personally, I don't, I don't think I'll ever buy another property again without having a property investment advisor on board. It, it's just... It's not even. It's not even so much if you get it wrong. You don't want to get it wrong, but the benefits of getting it right are huge, especially if you compound over time. You know what I mean. If your if your goal is really aggressive, you, you want to buy you know investment property every two years or something like that. You nail every single one, and over twenty years, you're going to do very very well out of it. Exactly. Right. Do you know what I mean? If you stuff up every single one, you're going to be broke before you get to the ten year mark. So. And that's what I think um, the buyer's agent industry is such as somewhat, it's come out of the back of a cottage industry, um, you know, where it's a, might be a buyer's agent and his, and his team located in one location, maybe Melbourne or Sydney or wherever it might be. They've got their pocket that they know really well and they absolutely serve a purpose for the right people that are buying in that location. But it's more there maybe to facilitate a one-off transaction. So what's your budget? What type of property? Bedrooms, bathrooms, key criteria. Let's go and source that asset, both on market, off market, transact, and then sort of jobs done to a degree. That's a traditional buyer's agent. It's there and it facilitates a purpose, particularly I think more for your home buying yeah, clients. Um, and it's important they know the area well, but where I think things are changing in, for some of us in our industry is actually taking that advice piece, um, being completely independent on what market or unbiased to the market you're buying in. Um, Australia is amazing. You know, if we had, if Australia was one property market, and let's say the timing of the cycle in the Australian market was the same as what Sydney is today, then we'd all be, I believe, sitting here for the next couple of years with the market tracking sideways. But that's not the case. There's multiple markets within Australia, and that's great. So it gives people the opportunity to maybe migrate their money or migrate their equity around the country to build a portfolio where different markets are in different stages in the cycle. None of us have a crystal ball. None of us can I time it to a T and some people do and there's a bit of luck involved. But if you can use all the analysis, statistical analysis, data, on the ground evidence as much as possible to try and get the timing as close to right as possible and then experience short to medium term upside, utilize that equity and go again. Um, so we're, we're changing uh, us and other peers in the industry, changing from that facilitating one-off transaction buyer's agent service to more property advisory, wealth creation, long-term journey, let's build a portfolio. Oh, fundamentally, it's a better way of doing it. It's what it's all about, it's really. It's really how it should be done. Yeah, that's right. But it, it was often quite hard because you only knew your one pocket. Mm. That was the only area you buying. Didn't have the data. Didn't have the data. Didn't have the, the knowledge. Um, maybe the, the geographical reach of different offices, et cetera, et cetera. So. And it's interesting to see how this will all shift and change um, because I think that I guess there's a lot more access to information to allow you guys to, to play that advisor role and, and have a, a robust value proposition when it comes to the asset selection piece. And I was actually surprised by the amount of, of buyers agents that don't have that. They're just use, relying on their ace up their sleeve and saying, well, I have a big network and I can get properties off market. Yeah. And, and we know that majority of the time, depending on where we are in the cycle, that's either valuable or it's not. Yeah. Um, but that's only one piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Um, how do you select the asset? And how do we know that something is going to have the fundamentals to perform yeah. over, over the long term? Yeah. Um, and as you said before, get the timing as right as possible. Yeah. So on that point, mate, what have, what have you done in, in your business that's a, uh, I guess allowed you to build that, that value proposition of, of how you select assets. Yeah, well, I think one of the most challenging things for people and and us included these days is um, with technology. There's so much information at everyone's fingertips, and I actually think that can be more of a hindrance than help because it creates maybe analysis paralysis when you've got so much information and you're reading often conflicting advice. Then it actually makes you it paralyzes your progress even more so when we didn't all have that information at our fingertips um so 
Our probably unique value proposition um, at, at the asset level is definitely our valuation experience. So myself, um, James, my business partner, Dimitri, one of our other team, Will, another one on our team, um, all ex-valuers or have worked in a valuation firm. Um, so that gives clients a lot of comfort that the way we assess an asset. Uh, there's a lot of other due diligence that goes into assessing what we determine to be an investment grade asset. Mm. Um, but a key component to that is the valuation side. So one, the experience we've had in the VAL space, the valuation space is knowing what assets perform and, and not because we're often, often doing refinances or revals years down the track after someone's bought a property. So you get a good feel as to what performs and what doesn't. And also giving clients that comfort that when we do a due, a due diligence report on an asset and put our valuation analysis, is they know exactly there's a there's a marker there or a point where they go, okay, well, the guys at PMC believe this property is worth $640,000 in the current market. Um, for investors, we keep them pretty strictly to that figure where we believe it represents good market value. For owner-occupiers, obviously, there's a more emotion attached. They might say to us, look, guys, aware that it's worth 640, but we love this property, um, we're willing to go to 650 or 660 or yeah. whatever the case might be. Um, in terms of, uh, I guess, answering your question around deciding what markets to buy in, um, we utilise uh, Residex, RP Data, um, Price Finder, SQM Research, and then a few commentators in the market that we actually like relying upon um, to decipher what, obviously, we listen to all of their advice, where they think the markets are, and then make our own conclusion. Um, I think if you spoke to half a dozen of the top property advice firms around the country and asked them individually in one day where they believe, let's say, the, the capital city markets are and the timing at the moment, would all be pretty close because there's a lot of information around that in the media. So per fragment's sake, I think a lot of us believe, or I certainly do, we do, that purse at the bottom of the current cycle. So it's had a period of correction. Um, we're seeing some statistical data that's now that's pointing towards the fact that it's at the bottom of the market. The biggest question we have is how long will it be along the bottom or, or track along the bottom of the market until it starts to, we see some upkick in the market because the main concern we have with a market like Perth is it's heavily reliant on the resources sector. Um, Sydney, for argument's sake, we believe Sydney's at the top of its current growth cycle. I, I believe most property advisors would say the same thing, or well-read, well-researched property advisors. Sydney's at the top. We experienced the last growth cycle in 2000 and 2003. The market virtually did nothing for five to six years after that. I think we're staring down a similar situation where the market, market in Sydney might track sideways for a period of two to five years. So... At a macro level, finding markets that are suitable, everyone will have their slightly different take. You know, there's some people buying in Hobart at the moment. That's great. You know, they have performed well last year. They've got 12% out of the market last year. Um, we've had concerns in the past around Hobart, Hobart from an employment perspective. Mm -hmm. It's quite heavily relying on the um, the forestries, fisheries, tourism, etc. cetera. Um, unemployment has been a little bit higher than the national average down there. So we've had some concerns, but people will do well out of that market. Probably the next thing, if we go from a macro to micro approach, is it's actually the analysis the, at the micro level. So what suburbs, what streets, what type of assets in those areas. So Darwin, again, coming back to my example, there might have been quite a few people that said Darwin's a great market to buy in when we did in 2007, but because we bought inner city Darwin, the wrong asset in that market, we underperformed. Mm -hmm. Whereas if there was another advisor that said, go out there, buy a freestanding asset within the middle ring suburbs, that individual would have performed very well. Mm -hmm. So macro, I think there's a lot of information in the market for us all to c conclude where different mm -hmm. markets are in the cycle. It's then getting down to that micro analysis of what suburbs, what streets, and, and what asset types are actually performing. Yeah, and we've even seen that in Sydney. Like I think that everyone said, oh, if you've had property in Sydney, you've done phenomenally well. But then you look at the likes of people who had units in roads or around that, that, that area of, of Sydney. Perfect example. It's underperformed by 50%, sometimes more. Yeah. And that's, um, that's that supply issue again, yeah. you know, too much supply coming online. Absolutely. There's, there's a couple of Zetland, Alexandria roads, and they still might have performed, but not to the potential that Sydney mm -hmm. other assets have. So we determine, or what we call an investment grade asset. The problem is in a rising market, all assets tend to perform reasonably well. Yeah. So properties on main roads, sub arterial roads, because it's that FOMO, that fear of missing out. Everyone's going, God, the market's rising. I need to get in. I'll buy that. It's on a sub arterial road, but I just need to get in. Mm. So in a rising market, all people tend to do reasonably well. 
the reason we buy investment grade assets is because in a stagnant market or potentially a declining market, they're the ones that hold value. Yeah. So Sydney mm-hmm. now, anything on a main road, sub two road that's in an area like roads or et cetera, you'll see that vendors will have to start discounting. Sure. So if they get into a sticky situation personally in life and they've got to offload that asset, all of a sudden they're going to have to take a hit because they're going to have to try and sell it at a discount. There's uncertainty there, isn't there? It's not what you want when you're, when you're in a sticky situation, right? No, yeah, yeah. exactly. So well, you spot on. There's Sydney, I mean, a lot of people have done reasonably well, but others have done better than, mm. than yeah. some if you haven't bought the right asset in the right area. No, that's right. Mm. Mate, you mentioned it earlier, you look at residential property, you, but you look at commercial property as well. So when we, when we talk about property, most of the time we're talking about residential yeah. property. What, what are sort of some of the differences between residential and commercial property? And what are the, some of the reasons you see your clients buying commercial property instead of the residential stuff? Yeah, really good question. We still probably, um, on a percentage base of the clients that we work with, I'd say it would be somewhere around 80% residential, 20% commercial, and that's probably looking like it's growing. So it might shift to about 30% commercial, 70% residential. Typically, the biggest challenge, and you'd be across this too, Sam, with the, from the lending perspective in the commercial space is that often your loan to value, value ratios are restricted. Yeah. Um, so that can be restrictive for someone to buy um, a quality investment grade commercial asset. Um, also, the biggest key risk uh, investors will face in the commercial space is vacancy. So I always say to our clients in the residential space, because a fear for a lot of people is, is vacancy. What happens if I don't get the rent to cover the repayments? And I totally understand that. But if you bought the right asset in the right location, as long as you listen to the market, you shouldn't experience vacancy or very little vacancy. So you need a proactive property manager to listen to the rental market. Don't just assume that year on year on year you're going to have an increase. Sometimes you might have to decrease Um, You're asking price to get a tenant in, but in the residential space, generally speaking, you should experience very little vacancy if you buy the right asset. Commercial on the flip side, even if you've got a good quality asset, often once you have a tenant that moves out, let's say, it might take you quite a a period of time to secure another quality tenant, and then you've got that holding period or that cash flow shortfall. So typically, a lot of the clients that are buying commercial assets are medium to high net worth individuals that can can take or absorb that shortfall in cash flow. Yeah. Um, and typically, whilst you still get capital appreciation or capital growth in commercial, um, it's more uh, an investment purchase for cash flow as opposed to um, as opposed to residential, which is capital growth. So where your tenants might be paying a lot of the outgoings, et cetera. So your net yield, what we call net yield, and in residential, we often refer to your rentals as a gross yield. Um, but in, in commercial, if it's a net yield, that's because your, te- your tenants paid all the outgoings. So typically, you'll ho- get a higher net yield or a stronger cash flow. Um, although in this market, um, because the appetite for commercial properties has been significant as well in some markets, we're seeing yields getting squashed So or, or coming in a bit shorter. So Yeah, because there's more means for negotiation in commercial, right, I guess? Yeah. Particularly if the property's been on the market for a while. Definitely. The tenants come in and they say, okay, I want you to pay for my fit out or cover this or cover that. And that's your spot on, Jackson. That's why you'll see often a, a reason why a vendor, uh, sorry, a landlord or vendor will often offer big incentives for commercial. So let's say they might offer you three months or six months rent free is because that's a good thing for you as a tenant. You get three months or six months rent free, but they'll keep the asking rent at the same price because the value is associated or very much in line or determined by the yield you get on a commercial property. Yeah, correct. So as opposed to reducing the rent, they'll, in, they'll, they'll keep the asking rent but give you six months free rent. So then when you're, if they come to sell the property three month, three years into that lease term, might be a five-year term, that it's held its value. Um, but there's definitely more risk associated. And the other thing is you typically in commercial want to be trying to buy A or B grade investment stock that has a good quality tenant to minimise vacancy. You know, small businesses unfortunately sometimes don't work out. They might go bankrupt all of a sudden you're left with a vacant property if you're looking at C and D grade or E grade assets. So your A and B grade stock typically require a higher budget too. Yeah. So most of the buying we're doing for our clients is minimum million dollar budget mm-hmm. and sometimes that's a bit cost prohibitive for some clients. Sure. Yeah, well, we've seen that the appetite for commercial has been picking up and, and there's been a lot of talk in the media about a commercial correction, particularly on the northern beaches as well. Why do you think that is, mate? Do you think that's been because of the 
it's becoming more popular, that people have made wealth in resi and they're probably looking to shift into something a little bit more sexy and sophisticated and that's driven up prices? Or? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's a good question. I don't really have a definitive answer for the reason why. Um, I think the Northern Beaches in general is growing in popularity, um, both from a business perspective, so people looking for their premises on the Northern Beaches, um, definitely it's had a significant amount of interest from um, demand on the resi side over the last cycle. I think it's been one of the best performing um, metropolitan areas in Sydney, the Northern Beaches. Uh, it's got all the lifestyle benefits. So I think a lot of people are realising that they don't necessarily have to have their business premises in the city or, or North Sydney or St Leonard's or, you know, there's the commercial space in Manly. I mean, the square metre rates in Manly are going through the roof because people are happy to now have a presence in Manly and commute back and forth to the CBD. Likewise, where you guys are, you know, it's a brilliant spot here. Um, techno- technology's probably played a part in that as well because there might be a satellite, a satellite office in a location like this or Manly with the head office in Manly. Oh, sorry, in the city. Um, so, yeah, I think that might play a part in it. Um, sophisticated investors um, probably see that if we've got a rising interest rate environment, they might start to become a bit more cash flow sensitive, the therefore units. target yielding assets as opposed to growth assets Mm -hmm. and maybe that's why the appetite's increased as well in the commercial space yeah it's interesting yeah yeah look i think moving forward it's going to be really interesting to see what happens in in property overall across australia i think that we're very unique when we compare our property market to that of, of other developed countries like look at the us for example and obviously it's a different kettle of fish and i think that particularly through the global financial crisis people try and tar Australia with the same brush of what happened there to what could potentially happen here and kind of took calling it a perfect storm. Um, but I think a lot of people overlook that our lending environment is a very responsible lending environment. And I guess the, the issue with, with the US property was it was a no recourse lending where they were lending what, 100, 120% of the value right. of the properties yeah. where you go, oh, I don't feel like paying my house anymore. Here's the keys. Yeah, See you later. Yeah, jingle mail. Yeah, they yeah. call it jingle mail. We, <laughs> <certainly don't, laughs> yeah, we certainly don't have that here. That's yeah, for sure. and uh, so so on that note, mate, what do you what would you what do you have to say about this whole um, like media uh, scare I'm, scare hype around um, there being this massive correction across yeah. the country? Yeah, I, I don't think there's going to be a correction, and I'm certainly not just saying that because we're in the property space. Um, I think we do have a very unique um, property market in Australia. There's a lot of um, there was an interesting article that just recently came out. I'll have to share with you guys, talking about we have the number one, we're the number one country um, with uh, number of high net worths, and I think it's decided on the basis of someone having a net asset base of more than a million US dollars mm-hmm. moving to Australia, other than in, any other country in, in the world. Yeah. And I think next in line might have been Canada, then Norway, and you can see all the lifestyle factors and the reason why people love doing. Um, business down here in Australia. In that article, it also said that um, Australia, from a female's perspective, that Australia is viewed as the safest country in the world for a female. So there's a lot of attractive attributes as to the reason why people want to reside in Australia or move to Australia. Um, We're at the foot of the Asian economy and and the growth that we're seeing up there. Australia is very landlocked as well. You know, we've got high um, population densities in our capital cities. So we don't have that issue like the US where they can, there's not so much, they don't have as many supply restrictions. So, you know, they're putting up houses left, right and centre. For argument's sake, Sydney, we're very landlocked. So the only way we can actually increase supply in Sydney is actually by putting units into the air or the southwestern corridor out towards Camden and Campbelltown and that area. But we've got the, the coast on one side, the Hawkesbury River and the Garigal National Park to the north. We've got the Royal National Park to the south. Um, we've got the Blue Mountains to the west. So the only real corridor we can actually increase supply is southwest. So that's a good thing from a price perspective because it holds values. Um, yeah, I, I, I can't see a correction occurring. I think we, APRA have done a, a pretty good job. Whilst it might, it might be difficult for some people from a lending perspective. Definitely. It's, it's, yeah, I view it as a, as a good thing. Um, I think a bit of short term pain for, for certain buyers, maybe certain businesses, et cetera. Um, it reduces the risk. Uh, I think it was quite responsible from APRA to put some of the restrictions or the credit restrictions they've put in place whether it might be serviceability restrictions on investors, yeah. um, inc- decreasing rates on principal and interest repayments, increasing rates on interest that only. Um, there's a lot of people that will now be paying off principal of their loan, which will be decreasing loan-to-value ratios. 
I think we'll be right. I think I wouldn't be surprised if we see, as I said, Sydney track sideways for a period of time. Mm-hmm. If the market comes back a couple of percent, it's no big deal. We've done 70% over the last, or thereabouts, over the mm-hmm. last four and a half years. Take if it, points back. If it comes yeah, back yeah, 5%, yeah. It's, uh, we're certainly not seeing correction. <laughs> Unfortunately, the problem is the media catch on. As soon as they see 1% correction in Sydney prices, the world's about to fall in, or mm-hmm. this, the, and that's not the case. So if we've seen papers. 70% and we've, we see a 5% correction, which I actually don't think we will, then um, so be it. Mm, it's interesting. I, we spoke about it today, and... Um, I'm, I'm a big advocate for, for Scott Pape, the, the barefoot investor. I'm not sure if you've read his book. Yeah, no, I haven't. Um, yeah. But it's, it's a phenomenal book, and, and I really think that it was bestseller last year. I think they sold 400,000 copies in Australia, and it might be not enough. Um, I think more people need to learn the language of money. Um, but one thing I don't agree with him on is that he doesn't believe in investment property. He believes you should own your own home to give yourself stability and pay it off so you don't have to be a slave to, to a landlord when, when you're in your later years. But he doesn't believe in property as an investment class. And... He does a case study about um, property over 500 years in Europe, like in, in Amsterdam. It's all, on average, it's gone up 1% or not even 1% a year. Well, let's talk about Australia and all the points you just hit on, mate, that, that, that basics of economics, supply versus demand, Australia has the, the makeup to allow that, that healthy supply and demand to continue to maintain the growth. Yeah. It's a desirable place to live. There's not enough property for people living. Yeah, yeah, well, you hit, you hit the nail on the head. So you've got wealthy individuals and families and businesses moving to mm-hmm. Australia. You've got Australians already here that are getting wealthier and wealthier over time. And you you said it. You said that it's a safe place for women. That's more immigration, mm-hmm. right? More more wealth in the country. What do you think is going to happen when you've got more and more people who are richer and richer than they ever used to be vying for the same amount of property? The property prices are going to go up. and right. Things sideways, you said different different markets go up and down in, in, in different sinks. But over time, property is an asset class in Australia. It's going to do just fine. Yeah. Due to population pressures as well, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's um, yeah, it's it, it'll be interesting. I think I wouldn't the way the conversation I have with our clients is I actually think that a property cycle. So you you'll hear people say time and time again a property residential property cycle in Australia historically um, cycles every seven to ten years, or your property will double every seven to ten years. I actually wouldn't be surprised if that pushes out to 10 to 12 years or slightly longer. So you, mm-hmm. your cycles will be longer cycles because I don't think we'll quite see the growth rates we have in the last, like we have in the last three decades. Sure. Um, we went where Keating deregulated the banks, which increased everyone's lending um, capacity. Um, then we went from single in- income households to dual income households, which again increased our borrowing capacity. And now we're going through historical low interest rates as a result of the GFC, et cetera, and creating stimulus in the economy. Um, what's the next step that's going to create that acceleration? Are we going to send all our kids to work so we get a, a triple income household? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, there's not, I don't see another significant event causing the acceleration of house prices. Without a doubt, um, our debt levels, whichever way you want to measure it to GDP, to, um, to incomes, to households, or to house average house prices, they look expensive on a number of metrics. But so does Canada, so does Norway, so does Sweden, so does a lot of the desirable countries yeah, around the world, country, where there's stable political environment, safety, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if house prices slow over the coming decade. But the reason we love properties and asset class is through responsible lending is you've got the ability to leverage your own equity or your own capital to then get your return on that investment, which can be significant. So if you're putting 20% of your own money down and borrowing 80% of someone else's, you don't actually have to get that greater return to get a very good... It's so amplified. Exactly, it's so amplified. So that's the reason why... And obviously, it's got to be responsible. Responsible leverage, responsible lending, um, making sure that's obviously the role of the two of you to make sure cash flows aren't tight. A, A comment on that is that when we send a due diligence report through to our clients, we send a cash flow forecast and we do all our cash flow forecasts on pre-tax dollars. So we don't try and factor in the depreciation of the property. We don't try and factor in that individual's income position and what the tax deductions would be. Unfortunately, I think some peers in the industry will do it post-tax cash flow forecast and then turn around and say, so Sam, um, if you cut out three coffees a week, that's all it's going to co- cost you to hold on to the asset. And unfortunately, I think that's more used as a selling tool. Yeah. My view is if someone can't hold on to an asset on a pre-tax basis, sure. then maybe they shouldn't be buying yeah, in the first place. There's, there's not enough buffer there. There's not enough buffer there. And then, then when you do your tax return, you get a nice tax return, put into your offset account or go on a holiday. But right. 
if you're factoring in purchasing a property on post-tax dollars, factoring in depreciation and your income position, maybe reconsider it. You might be pushing the envelope a bit too hard. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, mate. I think that there's a lot of people out there that are that are chasing this whole negative gearing, depreciation strategy, or having uh, after-tax positive cash flow property. Um, and you shouldn't make any investment decision on the basis of tax. Because mm-hmm. uh, all tax is doing is the government giving you back some money for something that you've lost and only giving you cents back on the dollar that you've lost. So are you willing to give away a dollar to get back 40? Uh, it's, no, it's it doesn't on. make sense. Yeah, it's, and, and that's exactly right. Like Often people will come to us and say, but I, and this is absolutely no disrespect to our accountants sure. because um, depreciation plays an important role in someone's um, property journey. Yes, Although sure. at the moment, there's been some recent changes and it looks like particularly if labour get in, there's a chance that negative gearing might be removed to some degree. Um, but yeah, it's it should be an added benefit to the journey of what you're doing, not a reason for investing in property. Yeah, if you get reasonably good depreciation, that's a benefit. It shouldn't be the fundamental reason as to why you buy an asset class, an, an, an asset, I should say. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, I I think you touched on it, the the lending part of things, and it's it's really interesting. So anyone involved, anyone who's an active property investor or involved in the industry would know that over the past couple of years, lending has gotten tighter and tighter and tighter and harder and harder to secure. And I, I think it'll 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 probably get tighter and unwind a little bit and get tighter and unwind a little bit. I don't think it's ever going to go back to what it was a handful of years ago. If you look back far enough over time, uh, the lending requirements since they became unregulated, there was this big loosening of lending standards and they've just tightened up, continued to tighten up lending standards for the past 30 years and it's a, a good thing. Low dock loans and things like that barely exist today. Yeah. Right? They're, they're, they're a, a micro factor of lending out there. And a lot of our clients that we've worked with over the past three or so years, they've um, they've made a lot of money out of property investing, all right? So they kept coming back. They want to buy another one. They want to buy another one because they've done so well out of it. Now that they've got two or three, they come back. They go, Sam, let's go see the bank. We're going to buy number four, number five, or whatever it is. I say, mate, the rules have changed. You, you can't. You can't borrow anymore, but I can afford it. I'm doing better than ever. Yeah, I know, mate, but the rules have changed and you can't afford to borrow that amount of money. And on while on one hand, it looks like it's it's slowing down the property markets, right, because people can't borrow as much. A lot of the people that are saying that are, are ambitious people, okay? So they're, uh, you know, I had a conversation this morning. So they, they go, all right, well, what do I need? I said, well, you're in business. You're running a small business. You need to earn more. You need to make more money. All right, so they go away and they're going to push their businesses harder. Their businesses are going to earn more money. They come back to me in six months' time. They go, Semi, got a bigger deposit. I've got a bigger deposit, and my business made fifty grand more in profit. Like this, the government got their slice. Then, it, then it did. The government got the slice. Then it did last year. What can I do? What can you do for me? I said, Well, mate. You've got a little bit more money in your pocket. You've earned more than you've ever earned. Let's go get you an investment yeah. property. Yeah. And I think that's what's going to happen. I think people that want to continue to accumulate wealth, even though lending's tighter, they're going to figure it out. They're going to figure out how to keep going. In the I agree, mate. I think that um, this whole thing and, and the whole tightening, there's either people that are going to really piss on mine about it and they're going to find any excuse to not take action. Yeah. The barrier to entry is too high. I can't save enough money. Property's accelerating too fast. And there's going to be people who... Tighten up their boots. They get to work, and they do what it takes to get a foot in the foot on the ladder and yeah. to really start their wealth journey. And yeah. and I say this all the time: people overestimate what they can do in a year, and they underestimate, underestimate what they can do in ten. Yeah. You don't need to buy a property every single year in order to be wealthy and yeah. achieve financial freedom. Yeah. Um, it's just about buying the right property and then having it work for you. Yeah. And of by all means, continue to rinse and repeat as as, as many times as you can, yeah. as long as it fits in line with your plan. But you don't have to do it as often as you think. Yeah, agree. No, absolutely. Yeah, it's um, spot on. Oh, look, without a doubt, it's going to frustrate some people. And without oh, a doubt, it might frustrate people in your space in particular, so from a lending perspective. Yeah. But um, responsibly for the overall economy, I think it's the right thing. Yeah. Um, it, it definitely is to take a bit of the risk and the heat out of the market. It's it's the right thing for sure. Yeah, I, I agree with it. And I think, you know, being myself, I'm a, I'm, you know, I'm a finance broker. It probably impacted, you know, my trade harder than all the other yeah. trades out there. It would have to be. It was a direct limitation of how much yeah. you know work I can do. But I still think, off the back of that, I still think it's a good idea. I still think it needed to happen. Yeah. And it's going to pave the way for 
the next 10 years are going to be better than the environment. Correct, better than the 10 years before it. So it's it's all a matter of perspective, I believe. Agreed. So, mate, I guess for for the person person who's listening or watching this, um, what would be some kind of quick tips, words of wisdom, either in business as a business owner or as an investor looking to continue to build their wealth that uh, that you you think that you could pass on from your experience, mate? Yeah, I think um, probably um, talking from an, an investment perspective, the property market is don't rush, do your research, um, but at the same time, don't. Um, what I say time and time again with a lot of investors is analysis paralysis. Um, those that chip away, and often, funnily enough, it's our um, middle income households, middle income families that actually eventually end up doing the best and own the best portfolio over time that they've accumulated year on year. Um, because they've taken action. Sometimes our higher net worth individuals are seeking a higher or better lifestyle and better cars, et cetera, et cetera, and don't end up taking action. So um, research, lean on independent advisors or advisors that have got your best interests at heart. Um, ask as many questions as you want, but once you get to a point, start make, taking action. Uh, I think speaking for people, particularly in the younger generations, if, if you can, and it's hard, but if you can get into the market, the earlier, the better, because before you know it, once you finish uni, um, before you know it, you're in your mid-30s and you've experienced 10 years and you haven't done anything, you might have missed a full cycle mm-hmm. that you could have potentially been in the market, even if, um, like I was fortunate enough to get a $138,000 one-bedroom apartment. It doesn't have to be a million-dollar asset in Sydney. There are many other markets outside of Sydney. It might be a great little regional market, like a Toowoomba, for argument's sake, where you can get a $400,000 freestanding asset it's more achievable, better gross yields, easier to service, so you're not having a shortfall in your cash flow. Um, but yeah, eventually take action because before you know it, 10 years will fly and you would have seen a full cycle through. Phenomenal, mate. I think that's great advice. Yeah, I think it is. And what about some, um, because we've been talking about property so much, a lot of the people that, that watch the show, they're, they're business owners, right? And you're a business owner. You've, you've grown a, a very successful business. Have you got any advice for the, the business owners that are watching? Yeah, I think um, without a doubt we've been lucky, PMC, uh, in four, just on four years um, with the market, the timing of the market. So there's no doubt, you know, we've, there has been an appetite both for investors and owner occupiers in the market. So that's, that's um, yeah, something that we've been fortunate to experience. But I think probably uh, the ethos behind what we've done and maybe why we've experienced some reasonable success is um, just being true to your client. Um, I, I always say to the team, if, if the client's number one, um, everything else will work itself out. So that's from a communi- communication perspective, um, from a trust perspective, having the client's best interest at heart. Um, clients sense that. If it's genuine, so it can't be put on. If it's genuine, clients sense that. And then um, even if there's a communication issue or mistake or breakdown here or there, if they know you've got your best interest at heart and you um and you're yeah, acting in their best interest, then I think it'll hold you in good stead. Um, we've been lucky that all of our business has been based on word of mouth referrals. So we haven't done any direct marketing or advertising to date. Uh, and I believe that's probably as a result of that, having the client's best interest at heart. Um, the rest of it will... And, and, not, and a big part probably for James and I, and hopefully this is infiltrated through the business, is that money within the business hasn't been our key driver. It's actually the experiences that the clients have had building a fun team because we're really proud of the team we've got. We've got 15 of us in the team. Um, and then the rest sort of takes care of itself. Mm. I think if you've got to get your key principles or drivers right um, and the rest will take care of itself. Yeah, it's so important. Advice. Yeah, it's very, very good advice. Mate, we appreciate you sharing your insights. I think it's been immensely valuable. Um, I think my takeaways of all of this um, is that, yeah, really should stick to what you know and get some good advisors in life that are going to help you take action because nothing happens unless you put in the hard work. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, uh, there's no there's no get-rich-quick uh, schemes that, that work for, for everyone. This is a long game. It's a marathon. Absolutely. Uh, you've got to take your time. You've got to do it right. Absolutely. And, uh, make the right decisions. So, um, mate, I appreciate you coming on the show and giving us some of your insights. Um, we'll, of course, include your info. Uh, so if anyone who's watching, listening, wants to get in touch with Will and his team, have a chat about property, uh, we'll put all the details for PMC and, and the guys uh, so you can reach out. And I'm sure we'll have you on again, mate. And, yeah, great. Uh, Thanks, have guys. a bit of Thanks banter. Yeah, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Thank mate. you very much. Yes. Thank you.